Yeah, you like that, don't you, girl? Oh, hey, guys, I didn't see you there. Bloodborne, an absolutely amazing game and the best game in the From Software catalog. And don't even think about commenting otherwise, my opinion is final around here. I absolutely adore this game for a number of reasons. It's one of my favorites of all time, and that's why I decided to do a challenge run of it. I love the feeling of overcoming obstacles after great struggle, so that's why I decided to challenge run this game at blood level 4. But in terms of like video creativity, that concept has been done to death, so I've decided to spice it up a little bit. I've decided to score every boss in Bloodborne, including the Chalice Dungeons, based on three factors. The difficulty and mechanics of the fight, the lore and relevance to the story of the boss, and finally, the sex appeal. And since I'm a challenge runner who's watched a couple of Vaddy videos, and I'm a degenerate bisexual, I feel like I am uniquely qualified to rank the bosses of this game on these criteria. I'll be putting all this data into a fun scatter plot to see if there's any correlations between lore, difficulty, and sexiness. With that, let's get into it. Up first is Father Gaswan, and we'll start off with a lore review. Father Gaswan has a very tragic story of how he was a father in the healing church, and he also is a literal father, but Beasthood ultimately got to him, and you can see that when he transforms into his face too. You can even talk to his daughter earlier in the area, and she gives you the small music box that can stagger him for a little bit. So you can kill him with the help of his daughter, and he really just has a sad story that's a very hopeless and sets the tone for Bloodborne well. I'd give him an 8 out of 10 on lore. In terms of sexiness, he definitely has a little bit of daddy dilf energy going on, but overall his story is just way too sad for him to be that hot. Oh, and I forgot to record my successful attempt at Blood Level 4. I was still getting used to the PlayStation 4 gameplay recording mechanics at this point. So here's a clip of me killing him in New Game Plus with a different character. Anyway, here's his final scores. Up next is the blood-starved beast, and it's easy to see why he's starving for blood, because you can easily just strafe around to his right, and none of his attacks can hit you. This knowledge really makes the fight trivial, and the only thing you really have to watch out for is the poison at the end. So he gets a 1 out of 10 for difficulty. Lore-wise, I don't really know what his deal is. I guess it's because he was, like, the leader of some church in Old Yarnum. I don't really know much else other than that, but I guess he gets a 2 out of 10 because of that. And in terms of sexiness, someone really should have told him that we are in a thick meta, and he is way too thin to fit into that meta, so he gets a 1 out of 10 there, too. Killing him gives me access to the Chalice Dungeons, where I run into my favorite thick boy. And his three cousins, the Merciless Watchers. The lore behind them is that our character is grave robbing, and they're trying to stop us. So that's pretty cool, I'd give them like a 4 out of 10 for that. And difficulty-wise, they did get me a few times, but they're really not that hard if you learn their parry windows. In terms of sexiness, they're definitely playing into that thick meta that we're in, and you can see that they're willing to do group stuff, so that's a plus. But on the minuses, unlike their roly-poly cousin, they're wearing clothes, and unfortunately they're constantly mouth-breathing, which takes away a lot of points. Anyway, here is their final scores. This game can be such a troll sometimes. Watch these guys camping the elevator. They hit me before I could even fight back. Up next is the Cleric Beast, and we know he's about to be terrible because Miyazaki hates clerics. Or so Patches would have us believe. Anyhow, he's not really that difficult. He's meant to be a very early game boss, and if you strafe around to his back, you can kill him pretty easily. As far as sexiness goes, he's big and furry, so he has that niche carved out. But as you can see, one arm is much larger than the other, so he's been beating it way too much. Probably a selfish lover. I'd give him a 4, and here's his final scores. Oh, here's the scatter plot so far. The color of the dot indicates the level of sexiness, with the closer to red being the sexier bosses. Up next is Vicar Amelia, and oh my lord, there's a lot of fan art of this girl. Which, personally, I don't see it. You know, she was the successor to Ludwig, so she's probably a stuck-up religious girl, hasn't really been too adventurous, you know? But I'll have to give her a decent score anyhow, just because of the sheer amounts of fan art. Lore-wise, she's also very important, being the successor to Lawrence. Um, she's very high up in the church, and is one of the last people to go, really. Um, so I gotta give her a pretty high score there, too. But when it comes to difficulty, this is where she really falls short. She's the hardest boss so far, but that's not really saying much. 
at blood level four, I think it only took her took me like four or five attempts to kill her. As long as you remember that you can break her limbs and to do damage consistently to the same limbs, you'll like chain stagger her and it'll end up being an easy victory even at blood level four. Put it all together and here are her final scores. Up next, I decided to fight the Watchdog of the Old Lords, the final boss of the first Chalice Dungeon. And I would say he is like the first real challenge of the run. And with that being said, he really still only took me about a dozen or so attempts. He has a couple of attacks that require somewhat precise dodge timing, but you can get a good exploitable window where you can whack at his elbows and stagger him. So I'd give him like an average 5 out of 10 rating for difficulty. Lore wise, I don't really see what he adds. His name really says it all, he was the watchdog of the old lords. But why is he on fire? And why does he why do they need watching? They were powerful enough on their own. So he doesn't really add really anything to the lore, in my opinion. So I'd give him like a one or two in terms of lore. And for sexiness, ooh, man. You can try, but you're gonna have a crispy pee pee, I tell you what. That's an easy 1 out of 10 in that department, and here are his final scores. Next up is the Beast Possessed Soul. It's one of those Chalice Dungeon enemies that the game decided to turn into a boss, and he's really not that difficult even at blood level 4. He does have a few combos that can get you if you don't know what they're coming, when they're coming or where they're going, but he's generally pretty easy to strafe around to the back of and get a backstab in or just some easy damage. As far as his significance to the plot and all that, I struggled to find any piece of lore on this guy whatsoever. I think he'll be the first one lore score. In terms of attractiveness, he's definitely close to the correct size, but he's just way too lanky and doesn't have any fun grab attacks, so I'd give him like a 2. Next up is the Keeper of the Old Lords, and man, she was tough. She has so many attacks that can one-shot or nearly one-shot you at blood level 4, and to make it worse, she usually dashes away at most opportunities that you would have to an attack. On the easy side though, she is easy to stagger. She'll stagger with most attacks, so that definitely helps. She ended up taking me like 15 attempts, which makes her the hardest boss so far, so I'd say I give her about a 6 out of 10. Lore-wise, she has just about nothing going on except for the fact that she was granted eternal life by the old lords to defend the great old ones that were down here. In terms of attractiveness, I'd say she definitely has a lot of swagger in the way she walks up to you at the beginning of every fight. And her willingness to dance with you the whole fight makes her very sexy indeed. I'd give her the highest score yet. Editing through this, a ton of my fights ended with gun spam. I really wanted to play it safe towards the end. Here's the updated scatter plot after Keeper. How did she know? How do they always know? I entered the Witch of Hemwick fight low on vials and uh, unprepared for the fight, and this is how it went. Yeah, she's really easy. I beat her first try at blood level 4 and was completely unprepared. Lore-wise, she doesn't have much other than that she likes to steal eyeballs from the people from Hemwick. And in terms of attractiveness, she really needs to see a chiropractor, and the eye-gouging thing is just not attractive at all. I'd give her a 1. Honey, I'm home. Oh, oh, uh-oh, oh, ah! What did I do this time? It's the Man-Eater Boar, yet another enemy that has been turned into a boss just for the Chalice Dungeon. And with a sussy repost animation like this, I gotta give it at least a 2 for sex appeal. Some people are into this stuff, right? And in terms of lore, these thick boys were used to clean up the massive amounts of dead bodies left behind the hunt and the church and their efforts. And of course, being a regular enemy that's slow, the pig is not hard at all. So here are his final scores.
Up next, I beat the Undead Giant, who there are many different versions of throughout the Chalice Dungeons, all sporting different accessories. And this old crusty boy is packs quite the punch. Most of his attacks will one-shot you at blood level 4, and he actually is much quicker than you would think. He's far, far quicker than the Dark Souls 2 Giants. And the later versions of him that you fight do even more damage, and uh, so I would have to give him at least a 6 for difficulty. Even though he's kind of slow, he still just killed me so many times. As far as his relevance to the story, I can't really find much about him. I think he's like vaguely related to the church giants you encounter earlier. And for sex appeal, he's hideously ugly, but he later in the game appears with a giant butt plug and chains, so I gotta give him points for kinkiness. Next up, I fought the Thumerian Descendant, and man, he is tough. He's very quick, he has a variety of attacks, and has a lot of ways to close the gap when you're running away and healing. The thing that really saved me in this fight is that he has a couple of attacks that are very parryable. Once you memorize the timing, you can get it down pretty consistently. But still, even despite that, he took me over 20 attempts. And while he's strong in battle, he's also strong lore-wise. He's one of the Thumerian descendants, the race of people that were basically guarding the Great Ones from the humans. And the Thumerian's eventual defeat at the hands of the human is what spawned the entire story of Bloodborne. So he's a pretty, he's pretty central to the story overall. And does he become our first boss to get all three high scores? No, he doesn't. He's uh, ugly, he's pale, he really needs to get out in the sun every once in a while, and he's just way too loud, like grunting at every move. That would be unbearable. Although he is a vampire, so I have to give him at least a two for that. Here's a clip exemplifying my great skill at this game. You can admire me in the comments below. I am really just amazingly skilled. Up next, the Shadows of Yarnum, one of the few gank fights in this game. And I'd say it's a pretty well-balanced gank fight at that. Generally speaking, they won't all start attacking at once, so it doesn't make the fight too overwhelming. But even so, they're definitely a very tough boss and took me a good dozen or so attempts. The phase 2 snake attack can definitely be hard to deal with, as you can see here. And their story is basically that they're guarding Queen Yarnum. They appear here before the Rom fight where you see the Queen of Yarnum, and then they appear again in the Nightmare before you fight uh, Mergo's wet nurse, also defending that apparition of Queen Yarnum. Uh, and unless you're into group stuff with three emo boys, I'd say they're uh, not very attractive. The snake arm would be fun to play with, though. I gotta at least give him points for that. Up next, we have the Brain Sucker, and he automatically gets sexiness points for having suck in his name. I mean, look at what he's about to do to me. He's given that good suck, and you know that could be transferred to other applications, wink wink. And on top of that, they were actually the slaves to the church in the lore of this game, so you know you want your slave to have the good suck. And on top of that, their su brain sucking attack actually drains your insight, which I think is a really cool mechanic. Cause you know, he's sucking out your brain that's bound to uh, make you lose some insight, huh? But where this boss comes up short is difficulty. He's really not that hard as long as you avoid the grab attacks that one-shot you at blood level 4, uh, you're pretty much good. Up next is Rom the Vacuous Spider, who looks like what a spider would look like if a 4-year-old drew it with no practice. But other than that, design-wise, Rom is really cool. She's covered in eyes, alluding to the fact that the god of this universe, or one of the gods, Koss, granted her the knowledge that would give her that many eyes. And presumably, using the power granted by Koss, Rom is concealing the blood moon, which only becomes visible after killing her. So she, like many other bosses in this game, are just trying to protect you from a terrible reality. 
In terms of the actual fight itself, uh, she's fairly difficult. Um, you basically have to clear out all of her mini spiders before attacking her or you're gonna have a bad time. But if you play it safe, kill the spiders safely, and then uh, go in for your attack only once they're all gone, you can have all of her attacks memorized fairly quickly to where you know when to run away from the arcane explosion and things like that, and the fight becomes pretty easy once you know it. In terms of sexiness, she gets a zero. And you know what, I don't even need to explain myself. If you find the turd covered in eyeballs and spider legs attractive, let me know down in the comments. You are a case study. Bloodborne is a very messed up story with many very messed up sub-stories, and the story of the Celestial Emissary is no different. They are the result of an orphanage run by the Healing Church, wherein they would do experiments on the children of the orphanage in an attempt to turn them into a being capable of communicating with the Celestial Great Ones. A Celestial Emissary, if you will. So all these little blue guys are uh, sad little children that didn't have parents that the church felt like using for their purposes. And from that harrowing story we get this boss fight. Which can be a little bit hard to manage at first, but they're really not quick enough to pose any sort of real threat. The boss is really here for lore purposes more than like a real challenge. They did manage to get me a few times because, you know, I'm blood level 4, but ultimately the boss isn't that hard. And in terms of attractiveness, they're children, you sick fuck. I'm probably now on several government lists for even talking about this, so please leave a like to help compensate me for this loss. Here's the updated scatter plot after Celestial Emissary. Up next is Dark Beast Parle. And this fight is basically just seeing how quickly you can break four limbs uh, before Dark Beast does the explosion attack. Because if you can break the limbs, you basically win, and if you can't, you basically lose, because the attacks are fast and lag the PS4. And in terms of lore, there's nothing really special about the Dark Beast except it's like the final stage of beasthood. You can see like bigger and bigger beasts gaining electrical powers as they grow and Dark Beast Parl is like the final stage of that where you become like undead electric skeleton type of beast. And yeah, this boss has no attractiveness to it at all, it's just bones. I struggle to even think of a joke about it, it's just straight up ugly, take a look. Okay, now it's time for one of my favorite moments in all of gaming. There are several pieces of lore leading up to this place telling you about, oh, there, there will be a new baby coming with the red moon, or whatever it says in Bergenworth, and then you get there, and the sky butthole opens up and shits out the one reborn. Every playthrough I do, I just chuckle at this moment, at the extremely grotesque and disgusting body of this thing hitting the ground. It's just, it's beautiful. It's so on brand for Bloodborne. I love it. I seriously can't say enough about the lore of this boss. The area he exists in, it's the one you get abducted to, and it's implied that all the people getting abducted are getting put into this sick ritual done by the Mensis scholars to make this abomination. It's just, it's a great design. From a lore perspective for a boss. From a fight perspective, it's kind of a gimmick fight in the sense that you have to figure out that the bell maidens are both healing him and trying to attack you from above which makes the fight like impossible so it took me a few attempts to figure that stuff out but once you figure it out it's basically all gimmicks go around kill the chime maidens and then chain stagger him with each of his breakable limbs and you'll have yourself an easy win like you can see me here i'm about to chain stagger him by breaking each of his limbs and get the win and making it look easy and in terms of attractiveness, I gotta say, you have to be one sick, twisted individual to be aroused by the One Reborn. Like, seriously, you should be detained and experimented on. Honestly. But, I will say that if you squint, it kinda looks like a massive pile of bodies having an orgy, so I have to give it at least one point for that. 
Just leaving this here to remember my struggles on this version of the undead giant who has the hook, chains, and giant butt plug. He was excruciating. Every phase 2 attack kills me in one hit, and the range and speed of those attacks is ridiculous. Up next is everyone's favorite part of the brain, the amygdala. After seeing them throughout the Cathedral Ward and how Patches worships them, I was pretty hyped up to fight one. And it honestly lives up to the fight. This fight is pretty tough, but pretty satisfying at the same time. You have to be really mindful of your positioning relative to the amygdala, so it becomes like a sort of tactical fight. But I've always loved big bosses like this, so I'm probably a little biased, but I do love this fight. As for their lore, they qualify as one of the quote, great ones of Bloodborne, but there's not too much known other than that. I think there's some connection with the bug guys at Bergenworth, because they kind of have the same like head with eyeballs coming out of those holes set up, but I don't really know other than that. And as for their sexiness, I would say it would take quite the brave soul to venture into that amygdusi that they have on their chest. Or would you say the amygdalusi? Hmm. Next I fought Ebrietas, daughter of the cosmos, and oh my holy lord, she was tough. I had the huge problem of not being able to properly dodge her charge attack, which I think was a guaranteed one shot. And on top of that, you can't really stay close to her because she has tons of tentacle sweeping attacks that can get you from any angle if you're staying up close and it's really hard to like watch for them and dodge if you're not, if you are standing that close. So what you really have to do with her is bait out her head smash attack and then get like three to four hits on the head which do extra damage and then other than that just shoot at her head while you're waiting for her to do that next attack. And this is the charge attack that killed me like 20 times at least. It is dodgeable but I only figured that out after like 30 attempts. You have to be strafing to your left, her right in order to dodge it. If you're going to your right, her left, you're not going to dodge it. There it is again. So she definitely packs a punch fight-wise. She's the hardest boss yet. But does she pack a punch lore-wise? And yeah, she absolutely does. She was captured by the healing church and it was the original source of the blood that they used for blood healing. That's why you find her like underneath the arena where you fought Vicar Amelia, the, the church. So she's super important in the lore sense. But in the attractiveness sense, yes, she's a hideous monster, but she has all of those tentacles. And I think you all know what I'm talking about when tentacles translate to interesting things happening in the bedroom. Uh -huh. After watching that god tier RNG, I can't believe Ebrietas took me like 38 attempts. Anyway, here's her score, and it interestingly puts her ahead of everything in total score so far. Up next we have Mikolash, host of the Nightmare, the boss where you basically just chase a guy around a library for like 20 minutes. Yeah, this boss is not hard at all, I only died twice at blood level 4, and one of the times was because I couldn't be bothered to run around for 20 minutes at the time. The story behind Mikolash is that he did some sort of unspeakable ritual to become a host for the Nightmare in the sense that you would host like a parasite. So the Nightmare of Mensis is the parasite in this case. Although he's dead when you enter the Nightmare, so this claim is dubious. And in terms of attractiveness, I am very relieved to see a human finally after raiding so many abhorrent beasts. But, I feel like he would be a stubborn lover with the way he walks away, and he definitely loses points for not having eyebrows. With that, we've reached the final required boss of the game, Murgo's Wet Nurse. This is the boss fight where we come to kill an invisible stillborn baby, which is guarded by an invisible wet nurse. And I'm not kidding, that's actually what this boss is meant to be. That's why there's no physical form for the wet nurse, and it's all like what would have been, basically. It's a cool kind of otherworldly concept, like 
Murgo was to be a great one and became stillborn, but his consciousness still somehow exists and started crying here? It's kind of unclear. Getting back to the boss itself, this lawnmower of a boss is very difficult. My basic strategy throughout the entire fight is to just run directly behind her. Uh, there's most of her attacks won't get you if you do this. There is one attack that I had an extreme amount of trouble with throughout my attempt. And this is the attack, when she swings the blades to one side like this as you're running around her. If you're running extremely quickly, you can just barely avoid it, but most of the time I was not able to avoid it, and it usually resulted in death. This boss took me over 30 attempts. Here are just a few of my deaths, most of them to that one same attack. On to the third score, anyone interested in the invisible wet nurse that might not even be real and just an apparition? Hmm? <laughs> Didn't think so, we'll just give her a zero. Ah, this was such a good feeling in real time. Here's her final score. Now, on to the more difficult bosses of the game. And we'll see if they're the sexiest as well. Starting with the Forgotten Madman, who is an NPC boss, so he shouldn't really be that hard. But the problem with him is that almost every one of his attacks kill you in one hit at blood level 4, regardless of what armor you're wearing. And to add insult to injury, he always emotes on your body after he's killed you, like what a cunt. And there's really not much lore about this guy, so I made up some of my own. He is a player of the game, Bloodborne, just like us, and he went crazy while doing that cursed Thumaru level 4 chalice, and completely lost his mind and settled in here, being another obstacle to the player. And when it comes to sexiness, he is insane, so I think that he's playing into the current meta, it's more meta to be insane nowadays. And he even has a call beyond for tentacle stuff when you're feeling frisky. Anyway, this guy is so forgotten, so forgettable, that I forgot to record my winning attempt against him, so all you get is, uh, unsuccessful attempts. Up next, I fought Martyr Logarius, who is the old guy sitting on top of a snowy castle for years who is somehow not dead. And this guy is the one who slaughtered all of the vile bloods at Kanehurst. Something I've never stu understood is he's wearing the crown, and he slaughtered all of the vile bloods except one, but he doesn't turn around, go up the steps, and kill the last one. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. He should be able to see it. Anyway, plot hole aside, he was a considerably tough boss, taking me well over 20 attempts to kill. But there are definitely a few tricks that once you learn him, he becomes a lot easier. This big magic attack that's about to come down does not track at all, so as long as you keep moving, it will never hit you. Um, and you can get him caught in a loop where you hit him three times and he will always step back so you have time to walk towards him, regen stamina. The first phase basically becomes trivial once you know this. The second phase, however, is a much more complicated problem. He will often summon this cloud of like magic swords that comes after you relentlessly even as you're fighting him and it makes it extremely difficult to dodge both the swords and his attacks. So yeah, he's extremely difficult. This death here had me raging. And I gotta say, he's probably in the competition for least attractive boss. Like, can, I, can you think of anything less attractive than like a frozen, undead, old man body? Like, you'd have to be deep deep down the necrophilia hole to be into that stuff, I don't know. Oh, that was a pretty epic final dodge there to end the fight. Anyway, here's the updated scatter plot after adding Logarius. Uh, 
Up next, the Thumerian Elder. And I want you to watch this for just a second to see my pain. Look at how fast this arrow comes out. He doesn't do the normal startup animations that he does. I just wanted y'all to know that I could have beaten this guy on the second try, but the game decided to have its way with me. Anyway, getting back on track, this boss is still pretty tough, even on the attempts where you don't have a total horse crap uh, non-startup animation frame proc or whatever that was. The Thumerian Elder has an extremely varied moveset. Um, his attacks do a shit ton of damage, and uh, he's really unpredictable. What can I say? He's a tough one. And both the lore and attractiveness section of this boss are going to be very similar to the Thumerian Descendant from earlier. They look almost identical. The only thing I'd like to add is, why is his mouth just constantly agape? He's just a complete mouth breather, and it makes it all the more infuriating to die to him because he just stands over your body afterwards, sometimes with that just agape mouth. Really frustrating. I'm glad I was able to kill him so shamefully with bullets here. He really deserves it. He took me approximately 20 attempts, and here's his final score. The final boss of the first Loran Chalice dungeon is the Abhorrent Beast, and I gotta say I'm a fan. Abhorrent is one of my favorite words to use in regular conversation. And he doesn't have too much lore surrounding him except for the fact that the beast man that you invite back to the church that eats everyone turns into one of these if you decide to fight him, so that's pretty cool. And for the fight itself, he is yet another very tough boss on this list. He has very few windows that you can actually attack him. He can usually have some sort of follow-up. You can only get like one to two hits in at a time. He has a lot of potential to one-shot you. It's just really very tough. He took me almost 30 attempts. And I would say he's probably the sexiest beast enemy in the game. Like, he's extremely fluffy, has no huge scars, and is approximately the right size for beast-human relations. Yeah, I'd give him a high score there. Oh, and in this clip, I was demonstrating the only, like, really safe way to get damage in. And he has certain attacks where you can dodge forward and to the right. And then you have a chance to get two hits in, and then you have to run away. Uh, so that's basically this fight. Are y'all ready for my favorite grab attack in the game? Oh no, oh no. <laughs> that gets me every time. It's the Bloodletting Beast, the final boss of the lower Thumaru Chalice Dungeon, and man, he is a challenge. He took me 40 attempts, which puts him above even Ebrietas, who took 38 attempts, and that makes him the hardest boss so far. It took me way too long to figure out that I really shouldn't be standing directly under him. He has too many tools to deal with that. With the grab attack you saw earlier, and a few stomping attacks, like the one you see there. The way to beat him is basically to approach him from far away, roll into his longer range attack, hit his legs a couple times, and then repeat. His limbs will eventually break this way and speed up the process. Lore-wise, I got nothing. I don't know why this guy is here, what they were doing to him, or anything like that. Uh, I have a theory for the headless one, but I'm, I'm really lost with this one. And this boss had some attractiveness potential, but man, that scar on its face and the crap on its back is just really off-putting. Torpedoes his score completely. Although we can't, we have seen he can vor you if you're into that. You can enjoy that, but only once. Now we're getting to the good stuff, the DLC bosses. Starting with the best boss in the game from a design perspective, Ludwig. This former hunter and honorable member of the church now has become an, a disgusting, ridiculous beast in the hunter's nightmare and is standing on a pile of bodies that he no doubt has slain and is probably eating. If there is one moment in this game that demonstrates the visceral hopelessness 
of Bloodborne, it is when you see Ludwig in his current state in the Hunter's Nightmare. He's completely lost everything, but then you get him to half health in one of my favorite cutscenes ever plays. All along. Ludwig, even in his disgusting state, has remembered his humanity and has wielded his Moonlight Greatsword once again. This is an amazing moment. I could gush about this boss for a long time, so I'm going to spare you and just say that he gets a 10 for lore. On to the fight itself, uh, he's basically two different bosses in phase 1 and 2, and he's very quick, does a lot of damage, and killed me many times. But I will say that the difficulty of this boss is somewhat held back by the fact that he's weak to beast blood pellets. Your beast hood meter is supposed to accumulate when you hit the enemy, but I think it accumulates with each part of him that you hit, and there's a bunch of part of him, so it accumulates up very quickly and you get that 70% boost in damage pretty easily, which shortens the fight a lot. He did almost take me 30 attempts still, so he's pretty tough, but the, the damage boost from Beast Blood Pellets is just insane in this fight. And when it comes to looks, man, he is ugly. He is one of the ugliest characters in fiction, I think. But I will say he has a bunch of horse legs. He probably has a few horse dogs in there too, if you're into that. Quick side note, I just want to say that the research hall is one of the coolest areas in any game I've ever played. The the swollen head patients walking around, the puzzle style way that you get to the different levels and rooms, it's just so cool. Did you know that I personally make a cameo appearance in this game? Yeah, I'm this boss. A living failure. But I'm trying to turn it around, please like this video, please. But anyway, back to the video. The lore behind these guys is that they were submissive to the Dami Mommy Lady Maria, and she did experiments on them to further her own personal gain. I'm sorta of kidding, but that's actually approximately the lore of these guys. Anyway, they're not very difficult, save for a few meteor attacks they do in Phase 2. Um, they got me a couple times, but I think they're really mostly here for lore purposes. They really aren't very attractive either. They have a very bland body. I think they're just a meh boss here here to continue the story. I would just like to briefly mention my suffering that happened within the Chalice Dungeons, especially the cursed and defiled level 4 Tumaru Chalice Dungeon. It was absolutely excruciating. Every attack kills you in one hit. This version of the Watchdog probably took me like 70 attempts. This version of the Amygdala that occurs later in the dungeon probably took me close to 100 attempts. This dungeon is just pure suffering and really I, I implore that you like this video to give me one small crumb of compensation for this suffering. Thank you. Up next, the final boss of the level 5 Loran Chalice Dungeon, the Loran Dark Beast. And this boss is just a copy of Dark Beast Parl from earlier in the game. Except both the limbs and the boss itself have much more health. The lore and attractiveness remain the same for this boss, but the difficulty gets turned up from a 4 to like an 8. This was an over 40 attempt boss when he has this much HP. And a frustrating thing about him is that he just lags my PS4 so much. It makes it the dodge timing like super awkward. Like, I don't know if you can see it. You probably can't see it in the recordings. I don't think it's showing up there. But just the explosion ex electric -y attack would always just tank my frame rate. I think I saw it a little bit there. Anyway, yeah, he bumps up to an 8 for difficulty, and that's the only change. Here's yet another Chalice Dungeon boss, the Bloodletting Beast, Headless Edition. Now, why is he missing his head? It's clearly because he's Lawrence. We find Lawrence's skull earlier in the game, in the uh, church after Vicar Amelia, and now we find this guy missing his head. You know, puzzle piece, puzzle piece, it all works out. 
Oh, by the way, don't say that on any Bloodborne subreddits. Otherwise, the people there will get big mad. I learned that in, when doing the research for this video. And I'm being facetious, by the way. Anyway, this boss isn't too different from the regular Bloodletting Beast. He doesn't have the grab attack, but he gains a few parasite-related attacks. He has way more HP, and killed me way more times, so he's more difficult. I think his lore is slightly cooler because of the parasite stuff, and then he's less sexy because he's missing a head. So that justifies his scores. Next, we get to fight Jarnum, the Thumerian Queen, in her psychic abortion. And no, I'm not kidding, that's actually a mechanic in this fight. One of the main parts of this fight is the baby crying, and he will always grab you with his psychic energy on the second cry, and then Yarnum will have a free attack on you. At blood level 4, this means you're dead most of the time. But anyway, her lore is that she is the leader of the Thumerian race, and she got pregnant with the child of a great one, that's Murgo, and uh, then it became stillborn because of her poisonous blood, and the blood she shoots at you does rapid poison damage, appropriately enough. And I think she's actually one of the best bosses in the game. In addition to her cool lore, her fight is really cool, with a lot of cool mechanics, and she has a good variety of attacks that do a lot of damage, but are fair. They're very telegraphed, you have a lot of ways to play around it. Oh, my character's about to get butt blasted. Oh, ouch. Now, on to the important score about her. But first, a quick story about me. I once hooked up with a woman who had her abortion in her freezer being preserved, and she even named it. I only discovered this after hooking up with her, but it really traumatized me. So take my rating for this woman with a grain of salt, because uh, I have been traumatized by that event. The queen has some motherly properties. She's tall, she's fit, all that powerful, you know, all that stuff that's sexy, but man, that, that, that stillborn Murgo is just haunting me. I can almost still hear his cries. You have no idea how good this felt. After struggling in the Chalice Dungeons for weeks of my life, I was finally done. Ugh. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower. She's one of the original group of hunters that went to the fishing hamlet to commit that atrocity. And she's running the research hall, which is the area we saw leading up to here, where she's experimenting on all these people, trying to turn them into celestial emissaries. And we talked to a few of them, and even though she's, like, really committing probably sins worse than the Holocaust on those people, they still talk about her like she's a mother or something, which is really just insane to me. She has truly committed some of the most heinous acts I have ever personally seen in fiction, so that's pretty badass. And it, when it comes to her looks, she's a seven-foot-tall dommy mommy, and man did I get dommied by her in her third phase but we'll get to that in a moment. The fight starts out reasonably enough. The general strategy you want to take is to dodge towards her and to the right as she's approaching you, and basically any of her attacks will miss. She gets staggered by one of your hits so you can get two hits in before you run away. And once you know these things, the first phase becomes uh, pretty reliable. I was pretty reliably able to get past the first phase after maybe 20 or so attempts. In her second phase, things get significantly more difficult, with her having several new attacks, a lot more range, and dealing blood damage as well. But ultimately, I'd say the second phase is still pretty fair. The real trouble starts when you get her to about 30% health. She'll buff herself and get fire on most of her attacks. In this phase, she is almost impossible to damage in a risk-free way. 
it feels like almost no matter what I did, it, it, she was unsafe to approach. I eventually learned like specific attacks that I could bait out that would then be safe to get a hit in on her, but it was just very inconsistent and I really strongly considered quitting because I literally couldn't beat her. I was banging my head against the wall for over a week stuck on this boss. Like a lot of my attempts I would resort to like bone marrow ash spam, but even that didn't work a lot of the time because a lot of the time she'll just uh, dodge the bullet and then you wasted a bone marrow ash and you've gotten no closer to killing her. So yeah, I definitely think the third phase of this fight is uh, having some design flaws. It's it's simply too difficult. There's like not windows to actually attack her and when you're at blood level 4 that just kills you most of the time in a frustrating way. I eventually just played it super risky and hoped that I would get lucky and I finally did. I think she took me something like 140 attempts. Ah, I'm so glad I'm done with that super difficult boss. Surely I won't struggle just the same amount on the very next boss, right? Whew, man, this challenge run is brutal. I would not recommend it. There's so many points where it's just so extremely difficult. I've done Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, and Elden Ring at minimum level. And this is probably as hard as all of them put together. This, this challenge run is not for the faint of heart, I'll say that. Next we've got uh, what was widely considered the hardest boss in the series before Melania came along, Orphan of Koss. The extremely aggressive, orphaned child of a dead great one. And man, he is tough. He does a crap ton of damage, he is extremely aggressive, and to put the cherry on top, he's screaming the entire time, as if he's mad about being born. Like, I died to this guy probably like 30 times before I even made it to phase 2. The only saving grace of the first phase is that he does this jumping attack at you that you can get a pretty easy backstab on. Uh, that Once I learned that, it was easier to get to phase 2, but still not guaranteed. And ooh boy, phase 2. Starting at about 50% health, he sprouts wings, becomes more aggressive, and gets an even more varied moveset. Like phase two, you basically have to just execute perfectly for like three minutes and really not miss a beat. It's, it's insane the level of perfection you have to attain to beat him in phase two. And there's no BS you can use to get around this. You simply have to memorize his attacks and execute accordingly. And I don't think he has like the same level of bullshit that Maria has with her second phase where there's really no way to approach. Like. He does have windows to attack him, unlike her in Phase 3, um, so he did take me a little bit less attempts than her, but not by that much. He was still easily over 100. So we know his difficulty is high. What about his lore? The lore behind the Orphan of Kos is that he was sinned against by the Hunters as like a sort of original sin. Like apparently Maria and Garman like ripped him from his mother's womb and that is like the original sin of hunters why the whole hunters nightmare and all this stuff happened so when you take that into consideration it makes a lot more sense why he's screaming and so mad at you and finally when it comes to sexiness well he's a newborn child you sick fuck how dare you even ask me you're about to witness the culmination of a week's worth of suffering right here Ah, oh, that was such a relief. Okay, okay, who's left? Lawrence? There's no way he could be as hard as uh, Orphan and Maria, right? And that is right, he's not as hard as either of them. But don't get me wrong, he is extremely difficult, just not to the extreme extent that Orphan and Maria are. And the main reason for that is that he doesn't do the same level of damage. He doesn't have as many attacks that will one-shot you. He, of course, has some. But in Phase 1, the really powerful attacks are really easy to dodge, and he's mostly just wearing you down for Phase 1 until you learn how to dodge his attacks, and then you can pretty reliably get to Phase 2 once you do that. In Phase 2, though, is where things get difficult. He becomes extremely difficult to approach. 
leaving a trail of lava behind him wherever he goes, and he even has like these lava vomiting attacks that basically make you want to stay away at all times. But one of the things I discovered about his phase 2 is if you carry a lot of bone marrow ash, you can actually wear him down pretty well. This coupled with baiting out his lava spit attack, which I think was the easiest to exploit for some easy damage, was basically my strategy in phase 2 and eventually got me the win. He took me like 70 or so attempts, which makes him harder than every single boss in Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, but only the third hardest boss in this game. And who is Lawrence exactly? Well, he's one of the founders of the Healing Church. We see him in that cutscene with Provost Willem. Willem's telling him not to uh, research the old blood, and he ends up doing it. He really spawned the Healing Church, the Beast Scourge. It's really mostly his fault. And now he's stuck in the Hunter's Nightmare, seeking his skull for some reason. I don't really know what the deal is with that. But anyway, yeah, he's super central to the story, super cool lore, just a fantastic boss design overall. And on top of this, I think he has the single greatest boss soundtrack of all time, but he's a bit of a tease because he's screaming the entire time. And in terms of sexiness, he's too hot. Haha, <laughs> get it? Whew, almost done. Two bosses to go, the first of which is Garmin, the first hunter. And his story is basically that he had a hand in the forced abortion of the Orphan of Kos, and that spawned the whole hunter's nightmare. And whenever he sleeps, he has nightmares about it, appropriately enough. And for some reason, he's stuck in the hunter's dream, permanently helping hunters that come through there. I don't really know why that is, but that's a thing too. And his weapon is appropriately named the Blade of Mercy, because he's offering you an act of mercy, giving you the option to leave the hunter's nightmare and return to the waking world. Now on to the fight itself. He is quite difficult. Not nearly on the level of Maria or Orphan or even Lawrence, but he definitely gave me a lot of trouble. He is parryable, which helps, so if you learn the timing of his parryable attacks, it will make the fight much easier on you. And in the first phase, he staggers on most hits, so that you can usually get away with being a little bit greedy. But in the second phase, that's not true at all. He gains a bunch of poise, and he gains a gunshot attack that will always allow a visceral attack on you, which of course at blood level 4 is going to kill you in one hit. And this like jumping attack where he does the wind at you took me forever to learn how to dodge. Garmin is just a, a very tough but fair boss, a fitting end to this game. Watch me blunder this attempt. This is insanely bad. I was panicking. Wow, that was so terrible. That made me sick at the time. I was lucky though, I got him I think the very next attempt. And I know you're all waiting for me to rate Grandpa Garman based on his attractiveness, so here you go. He's old, but he's also very nicely dressed, tall, and you know, if you've ever been on Grinder, he probably looks like the generous type, so you know, I'd give him at least a 5 for that. Ah, uh, ending it with gun spam, just like how I started this run. And now that we've defeated Garmin, the Moon Presence descends upon us to make us its surrogate child. And no, I'm not kidding about that. That is literally the lore behind Moon Presence. He wants to be your daddy. So we know he gets at least some sexiness points for that. In terms of combat though, the Moon Presence is really disappointing. I actually almost killed him on the first try. The only thing you really have to remember is when he's approaching you, dodge forward and to the right, get one hit in, and then run away. And also in second phase, watch out for those bubbles he sends up because they'll rain blood down upon you, and that'll be hard to deal with if you're close to the Moon Presence while that. But I think he only took me something like five attempts, which is Pretty pathetic compared to the other late game bosses. And here's the final scatter plot, plotting difficulty, lore, and sexiness. And as you can see, there's a positive correlation between the depth of lore that a boss has and how difficult it was. And here's the number of attempts, approximately, that it took me to beat each boss. Or 
And here's all the bosses of the game listed in order of my ranking on them on sexiness. And as you can see, Lady Maria, the Abhorrent Beast, and the Brain Sucker are the ideal Bloodborne partners. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Since you've made it this far, click the like button. It would help me out a lot. I had a lot of fun making this video, despite the fact that some of the bosses were extremely debilitating, so subscribe for more nonsense like this. Who do you think is the sexiest Bloodborne boss? Let me know in the comments down below, I'm interested to see your response. Anyway, bye!